Hello. Thank you for coming to the Boston WordPress Meetup. So glad to have you here. And thank you to Tom and Rako for inviting me. It's been a couple of years since I've had the opportunity to speak at one of these, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come back. So I'll be speaking to you tonight about web management tools, a little bit about me first before we get to that, because you want to know why am I the ones up here and you're the ones down there. So this is me. It's me. Hi. Uh, I do a lot of different things uh, in the online publishing space. I have a YouTube channel where I review the latest entertainment technology. I have, I just hit 80,000 subscribers last week, which is a great milestone. Uh, I have two audio podcasts. I host Polygamer, which is a monthly podcast I've been doing for the last five years where I interview diverse voices in the tech industry and ask them about their experiences. And then Transporter Lock is something I co-host with a friend of mine in Fargo, North Dakota. We just launched it two years ago, where we, we review the new episodes of Star Trek Discovery, which is the best Star Trek currently on the air. Uh, I used to be an editor at Computer World Magazine, which has been around since the 60s, unlike me. And I am now a freelance writer for them, so I still have my byline there occasionally. And as Tom mentioned, I teach at Emerson College in the publishing department. I teach a required course at the graduate level about online publishing, Introduction to Online Publishing. And I've been doing that for the last six years. And you may be thinking, okay, you're a little skeptical. None of that sounds like website publishing management stuff. What does that have to do with WordPress? Good question. So a few years ago, I worked at MIT, and I helped translate their or migrate their website from Dreamweaver to Drupal. And then after that, I worked also in healthcare at Mass Ioneer, where I managed some Sitecore and Joomla sites. And none of those CMSs inspired me as much as WordPress, which I've been using for 12 years. So finally, I landed my dream job about a year and a half ago, and I work at Automatic, the developers of WordPress.com. Now, I work specifically in the VIP department, in case you didn't figure it out. Uh, WordPress.com is where you can go set up your free personal blog for anywhere from zero to $25 a month for various paid upgrades. At VIP, we deal with enterprise level clients that are getting millions of hits a month and our hosting starts at $1,000 a month. So if you're interested in that, talk to me afterward. Uh, my job title specifically is Technical Account Engineer, or TAE, which I have found doesn't really translate well outside of automatic. So when people ask me what I do. I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. I am good at dealing with people. Engineers don't understand that. What the hell is wrong with you people? That's pretty much what I do, but I find it easier to just say I'm a digital project manager. That's generally what I do. Not a, I'm not a designer, not a developer, not a salesperson. I just help manage projects that are digital. Yeah. So tonight I'll be speaking about website management tools. I have 25 that I'm going to share with you tonight. And there are many more than that out there. So to help me narrow the parameters a bit, I chose six criteria. Uh, they have to be free, although freemium is okay. So they might have paid versions you can opt into but you can certainly sign up and use the basic functions for free. They have to be online, so that you don't have to be running Mac or Windows or Linux or install JavaScript or anything. It just all runs right in your web browser. It's not specific to WordPress. These are tools that I've learned to use from Sitecore, Drupal, Joomla, Dreamweaver, et cetera, and they are useful for WordPress as well. I'm not gonna be showing you project management tools or team collaboration tools like Teamwork or Jira or Zendesk. That's a different talk. And it can't be too mainstream, so I'm not going to be showing you Dropbox. In case you haven't heard of that, you should check it out. That's a different talk. And again, 25 tools. That's, that's the max. I'm going to fly through these slides. It's 25 tools. It's still quite a few. And I've broken down to six categories. So those are the six categories. And there will be a link at the end of the slides that lists all of these tools in case you don't want to be taking notes. So don't, I don't have to back up and just say, oh, what was that tool again? Let's start with domains. I have some tools for if you're launching a new website, you might want your own domain and you might not already have one yet. Here's some tools to help you find those. The first one is Domainer.com, but without the E, Domainer. And this helps you find the perfect name for your website. You can, it'll search across multiple TLDs or top level domains like .com, .net, .org, etc. And if the domain name that you want is taken, it'll suggest alternatives. <laughs> So for example, here I punch in the name GameBits, which is my online brand, my YouTube channel, et cetera. And it says GameBits.com, .net, and .org are all taken. Fortunately, they're taken by me. But it mentions that there are some that I don't have, like GameBits.us, GameBits.io, 
gamebits.co.co is available. And I can click that link right there and it says buy now. So I click that, it sends me to a registrar and I can buy that domain right now and continue to squat on all the various iterations of my brand. Or gamebits.io, which is taken, I can click on that and it'll say, hey, click this link to make an offer to the person who owns it. And they will serve as a middle person and forward that request to them. So it won't reveal to you who the owner is, but you can still make that bid. Let's say that you have found the domain name and you want to really brand this, not just a website. You want to go all across social media. For that, I recommend noem.com. This will also search domains, kind of like Domainer, but it also goes across social media. And it will even do trademarks. So in this example, I punched in game bits and it says, well, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, those are taken. But here are a bunch of other social media sites where game bits is not yet taken. And you, I can now go and click through to all those and start registering my name, my handle, on all those different websites. And this is just uh, scratching the surface of all the social media sites that it indexes. You can dig even further down. For example, here are specifically all the entertainment-based social media sites, the health-based social media sites, the information ones. And it'll search the name GameBits on all of those so I can find out who is already taking my name or where it's available so I can go grab it. SDBot.com, if you have a great name that you want to use but somebody else is using it, especially for a domain name, this will tell you how much that domain name is worth. So for example, uh, it'll, it'll estimate based on how long the website's been around, how much traffic it gets, how high its Alexa or Google rank are. So GameBits.net, for example, is a domain that I've owned for 20 years. So that has a lot of longevity behind it. Must be worth, a, it's worth $250. <laughs> So, not a lot. Um, but I used this website when I bought GameBits.com because somebody else owned that. And I said, I want to buy his site off you, uh, off him. And he said, okay, SDBot says it's $800. And I said, sold. So that's how I bought it, was by us agreeing to use SDBot to evaluate its cost. Uh, this last one, or this next one, is Dotomator. Uh, if you don't know what domain name you want to use, this one will generate one for you based on web 2.0 savviness. So it uses all the greatest buzzwords like, hey, JetChat. That's not a product yet, but it can be. So why not? Uh, Cabler, why not? Uh, Mizu, these have great SEO, SEO value because like, who is going to be searching for this? It's not a word yet until you register it. FeedNation or Zoolane. Hey, these are great names. I just want to point out it is Dotomator, not do tomato -er. Uh It took me a while to figure that out. So yeah, it's not do tomato -er. But it also actually does give some legitimate, valuable advice about what makes a good domain name. So it's not just a joke. This is like, if you don't even know where to start, this website will give you some advice on, hey, here is what will serve you in the long run when choosing a domain name. Yorls.org is the next one I want to recommend. Uh, bless you. This is kind of like Bitly, if you're familiar with Bitly. bit.ly is a service where you can go punch in a long URL and it gives you a short one, bit.ly slash something. Yorls does the same thing except it's an open source tool that you install on your own domain. So it's a URL shortener. It's just like WordPress, it's completely open source and you can have your own database of long and short URLs. So for example, this is for my podcast, or this is one of my websites where I have all these long URLs that I've made. And sometimes I use these for my own personal reference, like I can't remember the link to my Zoom video chat. Well, it's kgagging.com slash Zoom. I can remember that without having to bookmark it or look up some sort of a short code. Uh, if I wanna put something on Twitter, I can use this short code really easily. It tracks analytics about how often it's been clicked and when, and from where in the world it's been clicked, and where those clicks came from, like Twitter, for example. It has a lot of advantages over Bitly. Uh, for example, custom branding. If you put out a link that says bit.ly, that doesn't say anything about you as a person or a brand. kgagging.com, that's my brand. Or gamebits.tv is another website where I have URLs installed. And those are URLs that really say something about who, uh, where it's gonna send you or who created the link. So you can create custom URLs. If I were to go to bit.ly bit.ly, 
and try to register at bit.ly slash WordPress, somebody's already done that. That short URL already exists. But I can make all the short URLs I want at kdagney.com because I'm not competing with the rest of the world. And I can change where they go later, which is not something you can do with Bitly. Once you make a short Bitly link, it's frozen. It's written in stone. With URLs, you can go back and change it later. So for example, I interviewed somebody a few weeks ago. And at the end of the interview, she said, what's the link to where this podcast is gonna air? Instead of me saying, oh, let me go create a WordPress draft, save it, and copy the permalink and paste it in, I just, without missing a beat, said, here's the link where it's gonna go. And that was a short URL that I made five seconds later. I didn't have the podcast yet, so I set it up to redirect to my subscribe to my podcast page. And then I was able to share that on social media. And then when the podcast came out a day later, I went back and I changed that redirect to go to her specific episode. So anybody who found it later and clicked on it would go to the podcast specifically about that person. One more advantage, bit.ly, bit.ly. .ly is the top level domain for Libya, which is not the most stable part of the world. If Libya goes down, I think bit.ly goes with it. So don't use bit.ly. Uh, and yes, there is a WordPress plugin, so you can create the short URLs right from your post editor. Those are my domain tools. Now I'm gonna show you some investigation tools if you wanna find out information about other websites. Uh, whois.ican.org. Whois is a tool that you can use from the command line to find out who owns a domain name. This is a web-based tool that does the same thing and it's very informative. So you look up who owns the domain name if they have chosen to make their information public. By default, a lot of registrars make your information private which is a very good thing in my opinion. Uh, but here's an example of, I did a who is for myself, gamebits.net, and it says registrar private. Okay, great. But a few years ago, I had to write a feature story for Computer World and I wanted to interview a person who had gone on to found a online store called Fangamer. I couldn't find contact information for this guy anywhere. And the story wasn't about Fangamer, but I'm like, maybe I can get to him through his store. I went all through the website. The only email address I could find was if you have a question about your order. I didn't have an order to question about. So I did a who is on Fangamer.com, and there is his home address, his phone number, his email address, everything. So I emailed him. I'm like, hey, I want to interview you for this story for Computer World. And he wrote back and said, sure, I'm free tomorrow at 10. Give me a call. And he didn't give me his number. But it was right there in the who is. So the next day at 10 a.m. I called him. He's like, oh yeah, let's do the interview. And uh, he didn't find that creepy, which I really appreciate. Uh, but a very useful tool it, when used for good. Uh, DNS Lytics. <clears throat> this does a reverse lookup based on Google Analytics on websites that are using the same Google account, basically. So. For example, most people use, how many people here use Google Analytics? Most of you, yeah, it's, it's a free tool. Google gives you a lot of information in exchange for you giving Google a lot of information. And it usually is done by adding some code to your source that looks like this, it's UA dash something. And so I just open up my gambus.net source code uh, from the front end that anybody can see. I found that code, the UA code, I copied it, pasted it into DNS Lytics, asked it to look it up, and found pages of results all owned by the same person. So right off the bat, I know that guy with the YouTube channel about video games also likes to write about Apple II computers, he likes to blog about multiple sclerosis, and he's affiliated with a real estate company in Lemonster, Massachusetts, because they all use the same Google Analytics account. So this is a way that you can find other properties by the same company, or to verify whether a brand is authentic if it's affiliated with something better known. Builtwith.com is a tool used to find out what a website is built with, what technologies it uses, what CMS it uses, plugins, analytics, CDN, embedded content. Again, I use my own website as an example, and it tells me right off the bat that it's using iTheme security, it's using PowerPress, uh, po yeah, PowerPress, Jetpack, Facebook, Google Analytics. If I scroll down to the specific widgets it uses, these are the, basically the plugins that I'm using on my website. And you don't even need to be able to access the WordPress dashboard to see all this information. Uh, I'm using MailChimp as my email provider, DreamHost to send email as well. All these different technologies that are going into my website 
and which can be determined just from looking at the source code. This tool will scan it all and report back to you. And that tells you what the website is built with, but what about where it's actually hosted? Are you using DreamHost, Bluehost, SiteGround, et cetera? You should use Bluehost, by the way. Uh, who is hosting this.com will tell you where that website is hosted. Or at least it'll tell you where the DNS is hosted. Sometimes these are different things. So for example, I punched in gamebits.net and it reports back at the bottom there, it says dreamhost.com, which is true, that's where it's registered. But that's not where the site is hosted. And I'll get to that in a second. You can also use it not only with domain names, but with IP addresses. So I punched in 192.0.66.2, that's owned by automatic.com, my employer. This is true. So if somebody passes around an IP address and you're like, where does this go? Eh, it's legit, it's owned by automatic. Those are my investigation tools. Let's move on to troubleshooting. If something is going wrong with your website, this is how you fix it. <clears throat> is up dot me, uh, also known as down for everyone or just me. Sometimes you are trying to access a website and it won't load and you're wondering, is it my connection? Is my VPN misconfigured? Is my Wi-Fi down? Or is the website down? And sometimes you don't know. So this is a tool where you punch in that URL and it'll tell you, yeah, it's just you, or no, the website is actually down. Something is wrong. So for example, reverseinternet.com is a tool I used to use and it went out of business a year or two ago. And it says, yeah, reverseinternet.com actually is down. So it's not just you. On the bright side, wordpress.com is up, which is great because it hosts 145 million blogs and my phone would be going off, it went down. So. Is, uh, and if you use like short search engine, custom search engine keywords in Chrome or Firefox, you can just type down space a website domain name. It'll automatically report if the site is down or not. Very quick shortcut. Pingdom.com. <clears throat> this is a tool for finding out how fast your website loads and also why it's loading as fast or as slow as it does. You can choose to test it from any number of places in the world, including in the United States and other countries. And it'll give you a grade. So for example, my website gets like a 70%. Maybe I have a few too many plugins installed, or maybe I'm not using caching, which I should. And in addition to this grade, it'll tell me which areas it's not doing that well in. And specifically, what assets took a long time to load. Here's a blow by blow timeline of my website loading what loaded first, what loaded fast, and how long each thing took to load. So if I see, oh, I forgot to downsize that eight megabyte JPEG that I put on my homepage, maybe I should downsize that a little bit, change the resolution. This will help you diagnose that issue. What's my DNS.net is another tool for determining your DNS. This is the domain name service. It's basically, most of you probably already know this, it's like a giant phone book where you type in a website like WordPress.com and it looks up a number because computers speak in numbers. They're like, oh, WordPress.com, that's how the humans call it. We call it 192.0.6.2. And this will tell you like what that translation is. When you punch in uh, gamebits.net, for example, or WordPress.com, what are the actual numbers associated with that? So here, for example, I punch in my website again, gamebits.net, and it gives an IP address. And that is specifically the A name record. There are all different kinds of DNS records. So the A name points to that number. But if I look at the C name record, it points to gamebits.wpengine.com. Okay, remember earlier, I said that my DNS was hosted at DreamHost, but that's not where my site was hosted. Now I have figured out my site is hosted at WP Engine. So this will help you also figure out where a site is hosted. So if you're wondering what your site's records are, on a very discrete level. This will help you figure that out. Geopeaker.com. When you're making changes to your DNS, it takes a while for that phone book, as I called it, to be updated all around the world. And Geopeaker lets you see what your website looks like from different places around the globe. So sometimes that change propagates faster in the United States and then it takes a while to get to Asia or Europe, etc. So for example, here is what my website looks like in Singapore, Brazil, Virginia, etc. Even more states and countries listed below as I continue to scroll down. And if I click that little button in the upper right for more information, now it shows me what are the actual DNS records, not just the thumbnail image, but the actual DNS records in those countries. So this is a large part of my job. When 
companies are launching new websites on my platform, they're usually coming from a different platform, like, and they need to update their DNS to affect that change. So I just launched a website a few months ago, the largest newspaper in Guatemala, and we saw their new website faster than they did, and GeoPeaker helps us see, okay, it's propagated up here, it hasn't gotten to you yet, but it will. <clears throat> SSLshopper.com. SSL is the HTTPS, that's what the S stands for in your location bar. It makes your site super secure. And mostly this is automatically handled for you by your host. They'll just like automatically install a free Let's Encrypt certificate every few months. But if you're actually dealing with the certificates, this site is very valuable. So it'll make sure that your site actually is functioning and secure. So my site, gamebits.net, passed that SSL inspection. My certificate is authentically signed, it is not expired, et cetera, et cetera. But it'll also convert SSL formats. If somebody gives you an SSL certificate to install and it's in the wrong format, this site can change it over for you. And it can also decode certificates and the certificate signing request, which you may have. So for example, I found a certificate uh, hanging around on my hard drive. Didn't know what it was because it was just that long string of characters all encrypted. So I punched it into SSL Shopper and it tells me, oh, this is actually a certificate specifically for GameBits.net, my website, but it expired two years ago, so don't use this one because it's not good anymore. I would not have known that had I not punched it into this tool. Great. Next category, support. When something goes wrong and you're trying to fix it with somebody else, something's wrong on their end, here are a couple of tools to help you out. Supportdetails.com. Doubtless when somebody calls you and they say the website's not working for me and you say, okay, what browser does it not work for you in? Have you tried other browsers? And sometimes that very first question, what browser are you using? Their response is, I don't know, what's a browser? Google, I'm using Google, is that a browser? This happens, uh, just talk to my dad. And this tool, just go to supportdetails.com and it spits out all that information. There is what browser they're using, what operating system they're using the resolution of their monitor, whether or not they have JavaScript and Flash installed. And you don't have to get on the phone with your dad and ask them to read all this to you. You just click that little button in the lower right corner that says export PDF, and it generates a file that they can just send you or attach to the support ticket in Zendesk or whatever. Then you have to get on the phone and show them how to attach something to an email. That's a different problem. Quickforget.com. Something they should not put in a support ticket is their password or their credit card number or any other sort of confidential information because email is often not encrypted and anybody can read it. Or if the support ticket system like Zendesk gets hacked, it's sitting right there. Quick forget is a way to send text information securely. And you can specify whether it should expire after some, so many clicks or so many hours, whichever comes first. So it will keep the, all that information out of your email. So here, for example, I told somebody, okay, I reset your password. Here's your username and your password. Uh, your, your password. And I put it into quick forget. I set two views or 24 hours. I click share my secret and it generates a link. And then I send them that link. And they can click on it, they can get the information, and a day later, the link no longer works and that information is gone. Full disclosure, this is a product of Automatic, where I work. It wasn't always, and I've been using it so long, and then like a year ago, I noticed that suddenly the copyright in the corner updated. I was like, oh, that's cool. Nothing else changed, just the copyright. Next tool, or next category, images. <clears throat> this is especially if you work with social media, but also for website design. If you're looking for graphics for whatever content you're producing. I have a couple of recommendations. Pixabay.com is the first one. They have over a million photos that you can use without attribution or payment, and you can even put them in commercial products. <coughs> so if you have ads on your website, or you're publishing a brochure, or a magazine, and, or any other product that you sell, you can use these photos. I, let's walk through the user experience. I searched for Vizslas, which are a Hungarian hunting dog, and I got a whole bunch of hits. I really like this one in particular. And I go to download the high resolution version and it says I have to log in. I'm like, okay, I need to create a free account. Don't want to go through that right now. I'll just grab the medium resolution version. Okay, there's a captcha. It says I can skip the captcha if I'm already logged in. That's another good incentive, but I still don't have to do it if I don't want to. And so I download the image and it says, by the way, 
<coughs> you don't need to credit the photographer, but if you want to, just copy this text right here to give them proper attribution. And whether or not I do, I end up with this beautiful photo. And if you're wondering what the rights are, they do specify that you can use it for any commercial or non-commercial use across print and digital, except in the cases where mentioned, which is not many. Very similar to Pixabay is unsplash.com, more photos. They have a slightly fewer, less than a million, 810,000 from over 100,000 different photo photographers. Still no attribution, still no payment, still commercial use is okay. So even though there are slightly fewer photos, I like their UI a little bit better. Again, search for Vizslas. I found no overlap between the Vizslas in one website and the Vizslas in another, which is great, because the more the merrier. And I found this one. He's going hiking, I love it. So I, want, I go to download that, no CAPTCHA, no login, immediately grab the high resolution without any hassle. Loved it. They also gave me text I can use to attribute it if I want to, but no requirement. And again, their license is very generous. You can use it to download, copy, modify, distribute, perform, and use the photos for free, including for commercial purposes. So very generous. Another image tool, uh, boingboing.net, which I guess is like a news entertainment site, if has hidden on their site a tool for grabbing thumbnails from YouTube videos, which can be very handy. So for example, let's say that you're searching YouTube for PlayStation 4 unboxing videos, and in the search results, you have these four hits, and it shows you an image that is a teaser to get you to click through. That image might not actually be in the video, it's just a teaser image. <clears throat> let's say you want to use that image, maybe for your featured image in your WordPress post where that video is embedded. You just grab the URL to that YouTube video, you paste it into Boing Boing, and they spit out that thumbnail image that you can right click and download in a variety of different sizes. Very handy. Remove.bg, it removes the image background. <clears throat> so again, let's take that thumbnail I just grabbed from YouTube, I upload it, and it sh previously shows me in some sort of like a, a study or a, a living room, and it just spits out an image of just me without that background at all. And I didn't have to do any sort of configuration or green screen or just sliders, it just automatically did it. So whereas I started with this image from Boing Boing, after I upload it to remove.bg, I end up with this, which gives me all sorts of freedom to go to the jungle if I want to. So really easy. The downside is that the free version of remove.bg spits out a low res. So even though I upload an HD photo, it spat out one that was very low res. You can pay for the higher versions if you want. Buffer is a tool like Hootsuite for scheduling social media posts, but they also have a free image tool that you can use. Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, ah, Google+, all have different dimensions used for its images. Like, should it be square? Should it be landscape? Should it be portrait? This is a great tool just for uploading your existing photo and cropping it. You just click what social media site you want it for and it'll automatically crop it for that tool. So that last slide was Twitter, but now this is Pinterest. So it makes it very easy, but you can also modify it very easily. So if you wanna make image macros or memes, so there I applied some light contrast to the background. I added some text, I added my logo, very easy. Or it actually has quotes you can just randomly select from. Uh, you don't want to look like your heroes, you want to see like your heroes. Sure, why not? I, that was random. But there are also other images you can use to start with. And once you have it tweaked just right to share on social media, you can share it directly from this tool or download a JPEG and do whatever you want with it. So that's very handy. Audio. This is my last category of tools. Audio tools. That very valuable for me as a podcaster, but also if you're creating any sort of multimedia content. The freemusicarchive.org, I have used this extensively for my podcast, for the intros, the outros, and the buffers. Uh, bumpers, sorry. So it has tons of free songs for streaming and download across a variety of genres. So <clears throat> here, for example, I click classical, but even with classical, as you can imagine, there are still hundreds of thousands of songs that can broadly be classified as classical. So you can even further categorize it by symphony, for example. And even if you're not using them for your 
multi <laughs> online multimedia, you can still just add these to your iTunes library if you want and listen to them. Stream them right from the website. And they have even more filters you can choose from, including license, how you want to be able to use it. Downside is that this website, which is partially supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, actually said last year that they were going to go out of business. But then they got a new owner, so they're still up. But a few weeks ago they reported like, oh, we're having some bugs with the music and it's not streaming or downloading. If that happens to you, try a different browser and if it still happens, we're working on it. So over the lifespan of this tool, it's been very valuable. Right now it's a little questionable. I'm hoping it gets better, which is why I still included it in here. Pond5.com, great tool for buying multimedia. I have bought music from them for my podcast, but they also have a free service, pond5.com slash free. And it has videos, audio files, photos, and 3D models that you can search for. So for example, I punched in the word war just because I figured that's a very visual thing to look for. And I found hundreds, over 400 video clips that I can download, actual historical footage of soldiers, presidents, deployments, etc., that I can use for free. Bless you. I, I can then switch from videos to photos, and I can found over 164,000 photos, again, actual photos of war that I can use. So very extensive. And you can also upload your own photo and say, I want a photo that's like this. And it'll do like a reverse lookup and say, mm, that looks like this other thing in our archive. Headliner. I have found that when I want to share a clip from an audio podcast on Twitter, there's no way to do that. You can upload a movie to Twitter, but you can't upload audio. They want you to like upload to SoundCloud first and then embed that, and I don't like SoundCloud. Headliner is a great tool for turning your audio into full multimedia that you can share. So it has a tool, uh, various templates that you can choose from to create your audio. But what you do is you take your existing audio clip and you upload it into this web-based editor and you can add images, you can add captions, you can add waveforms, it automatically transcribes your audio and it's fairly accurate, unlike YouTube, for example. And then just like in Final Cut Pro, they have a timeline at the bottom that you can edit, drag and drop. If, depending on where you want to share it, just like Buffer, you can choose what ratio you want. Is it Twitter, is it Facebook, is it YouTube? And then when you're done, you end up with something like this. This is a clip from an audio podcast that I put on Twitter. When I first started doing charity, it always goes through are people going to think I'm doing this because I want people to think I'm good? But I'm actually trying to do good. But what if, I, what if they think that I'm trying to do good, but I'm not actually being good, and I just let the attention, like, your brain just goes in the spiral, and then you kind of have to just go, just do it, and it'll be okay. And if it's not, you'll work through it later. <laughs> so right there, we have the audio as it'll appear in the podcast. We have the transcript for, for all people of different abilities to be able to read. We have my logo. We have the waveform. And I upload it right to Twitter and I share it. And again, using URLs, I was able to put a link to the podcast before it even came out. It was an all-in-one package. So great for sharing your audio content. So those are my six categories and those are my 25 tools. That is the list of all of them. But for those of you who are keeping track, I said there'd be 25 tools. That's only 24. I didn't forget one. What happened was I left room for one more from you. So, <laughs> I'm sure you all have great tools that you rely on and that you depend on and that you would recommend. And so what I want you all to do is go online and tweet at kgagney or email kgagney at gamebits.net with your tools that I can put into that coveted 25th slot. And if you want to see the other 24 that I spoke about tonight, go to kgagney.com slash 25 tools and you'll find basically just a, a Google Doc with links and no description. It was put together very last minute, but all the links work. So, thank you very much. I'm done. Oh, question. No, sorry. Uh, question. You had a question? Right, why is it important to buy domains that are similar to yours? Because if I buy game, well, if I buy gamebits.net and somebody else owns gamebits.com, people are gonna get confused about which is which and who is who. Also, .com seems to be the way that the brain just defaults to. 
And I can tell you with certainty that I have missed out on emails because people emailed me at .com instead of .net. So once I, was, once I was able to buy the .com domain, I set up email addresses that mirrored all my existing ones and now I was able to get all my emails. You just don't want people impersonating you. You don't want people typing in the wrong address and ending up somewhere else. If, if I tell them, hey, my website is gamebus.net, oh, here's a better example, whitehouse.com. The actual website is whitehouse.gov and for years and years, whitehouse.com was a porn site. And people would go to that looking for our nation's capital and they would end up getting porn because they didn't know any better. Now, that's not something you want your parents doing, punching in the wrong address and ending up someplace like that. So if you just preemptively buy all of them, nobody can do that to you. Nobody can pretend to be you. It's cheap. So, uh, some, sometimes, like, if you were to type in F-A-C-E-B-O-O-O-K.com, Facebook.com, it goes to Facebook.com because they anticipated that common misspelling and they bought it. So I own kgagney.com.net.org and kengagney.com.net.org because I didn't want somebody else buying it and then trying to sell it to me for $10,000. I was able to buy it for 15 bucks a year. I'd rather spend that and sit on it and not use it than go to buy it 10 years from now and find out somebody else grabbed it. So, Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what, la last question. Unsplash, yeah. Um, if you were to take a picture and put it on your front page website with, without giving attribution, would that be okay as well? Can you take a picture off Unsplash and put it on the front page of your website without attribution? Yes. You do not have to give attribution anywhere. The only thing they don't want you doing is creating a photo website where you sell photos yeah. and selling their photos. So even though they say commercial use is okay, that's the one exception. You can put the photo in a commercial product, but the photo itself should not be the commercial product. So that's the one exception. So, great. Thank, you so much. Thank you again.